9.30, and we are going to uh, start our Health and Human Services Committee meeting uh, for Wednesday, December 8, um, 2021. It is nine, now 9.30. Uh, the first thing would be public comment. So anybody that, we're gonna give you three minutes. Um, if anybody has anything to say or anything, come on up. Okay. Thank you. I don't see any. I will say there will be a public comment at the end of the meeting again, too. So anyway, um, first one is, do yeah. I have approval of the agenda? So move support. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I, you know, when we do our updates, yep. we, I would just like to ask that I give my time up to a couple of my team members. We want to just give you a quick update on a issue happening with our food program okay. and a request that we'll be going to finance directly following this meeting, if okay. that's okay with all of you. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. Just five minutes. So, okay. Okay. And do I have approval of the proposed minutes from the November 10 health and human service committee meeting? All in favor say aye. 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 Same sign for no. Okay. Thank you. Action items, none. Discussion items. Okay, the first one is gonna be the Ottawa Food, the Ottawa Food Annual Update. Cheryl Schultz, am I correct on, on that? Yeah. Health Educator for Ottawa County Department of Public Health. Is she on Zoom? She's supposed to be. I know. Okay. She said well, that's her. Sierra. Yep, Sierra. Oh, Sierra. Okay, because I was like, Cheryl. Lisa is on. Lisa Ugansky. Hi, everyone. Sierra should be on the Zoom call as well. Yep, there she is. Okay. Oh, we got her. Hey, thank you for that. All right. So, um, yep, I'll be giving the Ottawa Food Annual Update. Hi, everyone. I'm Sierra Schutz. Um, so Ottawa Food currently has about 45 agencies and individuals signed on as active members. We are wrapping up the final year of our current three-year strategic plan. Uh, through strategic planning meetings with active members and data gathered through our 2021 Food Access Survey, data gleaned from United Way's 2021 ALICE report and the 2021 Community Health Needs Assessment, we have created a new strategic plan that will guide our work for the next three years, and the strategic plan will be viewable by February. Our priority areas include eliminating hunger, encouraging healthy eating by all, increasing the sourcing of local food, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so much of this year was spent in uncertainty as things started to open up apprehensively and programs were scaled and operated very differently than anticipated. Our Real Food Can campaign has been encouraging residents to consume more fruits and vegetables. The Real Food Can campaign addresses identified barriers to fruit and vegetable consumption, including cost and lack of knowledge about how to prepare these items. Educational messages are disseminated through print and social media. Social media and other ads link viewers to our Real Food Can website where they can find tips, recipes, videos, information about local produce and other resources related to fruit and vegetable consumption. And uh, these materials are helpful for other organizations to use and promote as well because we work to establish a unified message that um, eating healthy can be affordable, accessible, convenient, simple and safe. Mm -hmm. I had a photo from our Real Food Can website, but I don't have the option to share a screen. So I'll just send that out afterwards. Uh, moving on, Ottawa Food has been promoting the Community Action House's new food club. We worked closely to help Community Action House gain donors. We wrote letters of support for grant funding, continue to educate the public, and we have made a commitment with the Michigan Health Endowment Fund to gather best practices to help other food pantries replicate food club if that's something they're interested in doing. Ottawa Food has also worked closely with Lakeshore Food Rescue, which exists as a partnership between the Community Action House and Harvest Stand of Zealand. 
Lakeshore Food Rescue has created an efficient logistical framework for rescuing food and getting it to our neighbors experiencing food insecurity. Ottawa Food has written letters of support for grants, um, contribute to Lakeshore Food Rescue strategic planning, and will work actively in the future to build a strong volunteer basis to ensure that the success of this program, which dramatically reduces food waste, help those in need and turned produce into compost instead of filling up the landfills. Ottawa Food distributed 300 Senior Project Fresh vouchers to 265 eligible seniors in Ottawa County. The vouchers are used to purchase $20 in Michigan-grown produce at local farmers markets. Uh, thanks to Senior Project uh, Senior Resources West Michigan for funding this program, and su it supports local growers as well and provides healthy food for our low-income senior neighbors. Ottawa Food also has helped coordinate and promote meetup and eat up sites in Ottawa County again this year. Um, of course, due to COVID-19, this program looked drastically different than in years past. Instead of serving meals on site to kids throughout the summer, sites elected to distribute multiple days worth of packaged meal at, meals at one time. This year's total meals served is 479,444 meals. Um, which is a significantly higher amount of meals served than in previous years for many reasons, including this new distribution method, as well as um, the economic impacts of COVID-19. So this is, it looked different, but we served a lot more meals, which is great. Um, excitingly, we also helped the Ottawa Community School Network obtain a grant that will fund a staff person and pay for games and sporting equipment to be used at seven meetup and eat up sites. Uh, this is exciting for us because now we're going to be able to offer a hybrid approach to this program, giving both convenience to parents who need to pick up meals on the go, but also um, a method for kids to get exercising and socializing in a safe and outdoor environment next summer. I included the entire um, meet up and eat up report in the materials, and I can send that out again if anyone's interested on further data. So many of Ottawa food programs uh, provide fresh local produce to those in need during the growing season. Uh, Pick for Pantries, our program, brought in 679 pounds of fresh fruit this summer and fall. The gleaning program at the Grand Haven Farmers Market resulted in 1,484 pounds of donated produce. In addition, farmer market, farmer's market shoppers donated over 2,500 pounds of local produce to our food pantries. Ottawa Food received a $3,500 grant from the Michigan Local Food Council Network to begin the process of diversity, equity, inclusion work, both internally within membership and in the programs that we support. Using this grant, we contracted with two leaders in our Latino community to identify 30 organizations and individuals to which they explained Ottawa Foods work and uh, had exploratory conversations on how we might be able to work together to uh, improve our local food system and serve better. They also um, talked to people in the Latino community about the benefit that Ottawa Food could bring their organization. So we encourage partnerships there. And then beyond the scope of this grant, Ottawa Food continues to meet with community leaders um, every two weeks to work together on targeted pro uh, projects and building relationships. Lastly, Ottawa Food hired a food navigator to work at the Holland Farmers Market on Saturdays from August to October. The food navigator provided shoppers with nutrition information and recipes aligned with uh, produce seasons. He also promoted um, farm tours, um, helped shoppers understand food assistance programs, and he promoted the farmer's market to different um, social services around the community. So that is my update, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Sierra, the only question I got is you're trying, to, I, I know the biggest thing is to get the people to eat more fruits and vegetables, but I think cooking them, not the fruit so much, but the vegetables is a difficult task because it's going to take a little time always and effort. And some of it is good. And some of it, if they just boil them, they're going to not want to do them again. So what's, 
what are you trying to do? How do you get across people to, to use more vegetables in their diets? Well, we are funding and um, supporting some different initiatives to provide free cooking classes for folks, um, both at the food club and then even within the schools. Um, so we're hoping to kind of build a connection that, yes, cooking takes time, there's time there, but there's also value um, using it as a positive time to include kids in the process, you know, getting together in the kitchen. Um, and then also with Real Food Can, we focus on super simple recipes and, you know, kind of address the, you know, the time commitment that there's a way to do it quick and easy. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? Yes. Um, do you, are you guys partnered with any like deer processors in Ottawa County that if someone wanted to donate or something like that, they're able to donate and you guys could use that? Yeah, there are. Um, some deer processing places that donate to places uh, like, you know, Community Action House. I know from my work there that they receive deer meat. Um, so that's something that's encouraged. And, you know, they can work with Lakeshore Food Rescue to know how to donate that safely. Um, I think that there can be a bit of a challenge if that's not a meat that someone's used to cooking. Um, so, that's something that we can definitely do, but there might be some education needed. You know, this is how you cook deer meat. But Ottawa Food isn't directly in contact with, with anyone providing that. Anybody else got any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lisa on... Um, Zoom, do you have any comments about this or would you like to say anything? Hi everybody. Um, no, I just wanna say thank you for um, the time that I had serving as um, coordinator of Ottawa Food for about almost 11 years. Um, I jumped on the call today to, to hear the update actually because I was still coordinator for about half of the time and then Sierra took over. Um, she's doing a fantastic job and um, yeah, a lot of the programs in this past strategic plan were kind of put on hold or we had some challenges with implementing things when our goals were really to meet people where they are physically and teach them ways to make healthier food choices and then COVID kind of shut the world down. So Sierra did a good job talking about Real Food Can and we tried to get creative with ways to educate people online with videos and things like that um, because we couldn't be with them in person. So um, lots of things will be, exciting things will be going on in this next plan. Um, Sierra is doing a, a fantastic job. Um, and yeah, I just wanna say thank you for all your support throughout the years. With with the COVID shutdown of, of a numerous restaurants, did you guys see it uptick on either phone calls, emails of how to do this, how to do that, or anything like that? Either one of you could answer. <laughs> In terms of like restaurants donating food that they had or? No, no. When the restaurants were closed, a lot of people had to learn to eat home. Oh, yeah. So did you guys get an uptick in phone calls, emails, texts, or anything of how to do something or not to do something or anything like that? I think that there was, um, you know, pantries reaching out about how can we continue food distri distribution safely, um, right. you know, not wanting to close their doors. So I think there was conversations about how to do food distribution outside. Um, also, I believe the health department got some um, PPE to some um, different food pantries so that they could do grab and go style meals or create recipes. You know, we had these recipe cards so we could, uh, food pantries could assemble all the ingredients necessary, put the recipe card in there to try to make it easier for people to make meals at home if that's not something they're accustomed to. Yeah, I'd agree. I didn't see an uptick in, you know, emails or people reaching out with questions about how do I prepare this or how do I make this at home? Um, but a lot of our agencies were doing some of that, I think, proactive work, like she just mentioned, um, putting together prepared meals or having food available safely for distribution or putting a recipe card right in with some of the ingredients 
encouraging people to prepare those meals in a healthy way. I think also um, moving distribution um, of food boxes outside might have elevated the, you know, our community's awareness of food insecurity, because instead of, you know, people going and picking out some items at a pantry, they're having to wait in their cars. And I know at Community Action House, sometimes there'd be, you know, 60 cars in line around the street corner. And then people driving by would say, you know, what's going on? And so I think the community was more aware, perhaps, of food insecurity because they could visually see it. If I could just add, um, you know, I think Ottawa Food is such a tremendous example of how our community has really come together around an important need. Um, This is a collaboration. Um, You know, the health department happens to sort of facilitate some of the work, but um, all sectors of the community are involved in this. We've got you know, businesses and churches. And um, because of the work that has taken place in this community, when COVID hit, we were ready. And community spoke, stepped in and started coordinating around not just food insecurity, but some of the other basic needs that families were experiencing. And um, I just, I just think it really speaks well to ensuring that we have a foundation of support so that when we do reach a crisis like we have in the last couple of years, we're ready. And I, I wanna give credit to Community Spoke as well as Ottawa Food because they did a tremendous job throughout the pandemic to meet, meet people's uh, basic needs. Any other questions? Okay, we're gonna go to updates, department updates. and. Lisa, you said you're going to give yours up um, to two of yours. So, okay, we're going to start with you in your department. Okay. Okay. I, I'm just going to ask maybe Spencer to, to come on up or find a spot or sit in my space. No. Oh, okay. Okay, great. We've just been having some really big challenges in the food and restaurant space. And I know that we're all consumers of restaurant food. And so um, we want to make sure we keep things rolling along and we don't have any other outbreaks of anything else. Can't handle that. So Spence is our food supervisor. I think all of you know Spencer, so I'm going to just turn it over to him. Yeah. So I just, um, you know, we're going to be going to the finance committee next. And so I just wanted to make everyone kind of informed of where we're at on the food team and kind of what we're hoping to do going forward. So, and I heard you, uh, Mr. Tannenberg, say that you got sick from eating out which is like a perfect kind of lead in what I want to say. And the person you spoke with was actually a food person on my team, Kayla. I know she like assisted in investigating. Yeah, that she so did an excellent job. Doing. Yep. I couldn't ask for more. Yeah. So that's kind of an insight into like the background of kind of what we're doing behind the scenes beyond just doing, you know, inspections at restaurants and things like that. But basically we've had some staffing challenges. These are in no particular order. I just have some bullet points because some kind of what I want you guys to be aware of. But there's been staffing challenges at restaurants lately, obviously. I think most people have heard about these. Um, the Michigan Restaurant Association's saying that nine out of 10 restaurants are struggling in this kind of area. And we've, our experience um, in doing these inspections is that when restaurants are short staffed, you kind of tend to do everything not as well as you would if you were fully staffed, right? If that makes sense. So one of the things that gets um, kind of impacted as well is just like the food safety stuff that's happening there. And you have high turnover and experienced staff potentially in your short staff, sometimes you start to neglect to focus on um, things like food safety at times. And so we're sort of seeing that when we're out and about doing our inspections lately. Um, we have a need, we've had like ongoing growth in my program. So like 2021, we had more licenses renewed than in any past years for food establishments. So with the continued population growth, we've seen um, continued growth within that industry and yeah they've had their challenges like you've mentioned i know they were impacted negatively had to move change their business models a lot and do curbside and things like that um, but they continue to grow and we continue to have more restaurants every year despite all those challenges um, so with that continued growth we have like needs on our team to keep up so that we can stay on top of all of our inspection frequencies and respond to complaints of illness and things in a timely manner um, the fda provides us a formula for calculating how many staff we need to get all of that work done. And it's based on the number of evaluations that are required to be completed annually. And when we use their formula, it tells us that we need eight full-time employees dedicated um, to get these thousands of inspections done. 
um, on time. Um, with my proposal, we have someone that's leaving that's a part time unbenefited position is a point for eight is that I think um, FTE and he is resigning. And we took this opportunity with kind of on short notice to kind of reevaluate staffing needs with the current challenges and things that we're having. And what we're hoping to do is add, take his position and add 0.6 to it and make it a full time position. Um, in addition, to just the general need to do that. We feel like it's also going to be really hard, even if we said like we'll just make do somehow, even though it's been really challenging with the current staffing levels, it would be additionally really challenging to find a part time unbenefited person with a science degree in this kind of low unemployment environment we're in. And HR agreed that that would be that would be really hard to find someone that would be willing to take that position at this point. So. Um, all of these things, um, I have some notes just about general deadlines. And like I said, like a new restaurant that opens some its plans, we have 30 days to review and approve those plans. Once they're open, they get inspected every six, six months. Any violations that they have have to be followed up on within 10 days. Any general complaint we get from the public, we respond to within five days. Every food or illness complaint, we respond to within 24 hours max. So like we have very tight timelines, so when when we are impacted with staff shortages, like the whole thing just starts to fall apart really quickly and it becomes impossible to catch up really because the further behind you fall the more like, I don't know, impossible it becomes. Um, from a public health perspective, we feel like all those timelines really do matter. From a business perspective, those plans, um, and when you're trying to open a business and you need your plans reviews and you wanna get the doors open, those timelines matter to them. Um, so yeah, I think that's all, everything I want to say about it. I have some like the request that's going to go to finance committee and I can share that with you guys as well. Just so I, the more people that are kind of informed of where we're heading, we're hoping to visit the board this month um, to take a look at all of this. So yeah, we're just like a heads up kind of where we're at. Is there any questions about any of that? Um, yeah, Spencer, mm -hmm. um, are you, I know this is a tough question for you. Yeah. Are you caught up with all the restaurant inspections? Uh, at this moment, no, we're, we're, okay. we're behind. Yeah. Okay. And may I ask how much time you are behind? Um, it, it depends like what you're looking at. So I'm looking so, for a regular <laughs> inspection to a regular. Yeah. I mean, I can give some examples. So like we've tried to prioritize things to catch up. So we let some things fall even further behind because you're just evaluating like the risk, I guess, of falling behind. There's a difference between falling behind on a foodborne illness complaint versus a routine inspection. Okay. Or a routine inspection at a movie theater versus at a full service restaurant. Like, if that makes sense. So like, um, I know like there was a place, we got a complaint uh, this last week from somebody that we had to go out and respond to. And then the person's complaint from the community, they said, and I looked online and I noticed you guys haven't been there in a year. <laughs> and I looked and I was like, yeah, they're right. We haven't been there in a year. We're supposed to go every six months. And that's an extreme example. And not every place is a year behind, but we're behind. And like I said, when you're behind and short staff, to say like, we'll just go do a hundred inspections this month, rather than, you know what I mean? Rather than the normal amount, like you're gonna have to do them with lower quality, right? To catch up with if you're short staff. And that's just something I don't, um, I don't yeah. wanna do. I'm never gonna tell my team like, hey, just go out and walk in and shake the hand no. and report. Um, um, like that's not how we're gonna catch up. And <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm going to say the extreme, but uh, years ago, there's some restaurants right. that they, a number of people got it, okay? Yeah. Um, and then, if that would happen to the health department, right. everybody would be saying to the health department, why didn't you inspect this restaurant right. sooner when you knew there could have been problems there? So it's a no-win-win -win for you. Right. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I was just going to say, you know, you have to, if you look at the whole situation, when they go out to do a restaurant inspection now, because there's the restaurant or the food establishments are short staffed, things are falling behind. It takes them sometimes two to three times longer to do an inspection than it normally would during normal times. So you can see how quickly that could escalate and, you know, our team could get behind. And to Spencer's point, you know, you can't just walk in and, you know, take a glance around. There are um, critical 
things that have to be looked at that help a restaurant to number one, ensure safe food, and secondly, to be successful. We know that as soon as they have a foodborne illness outbreak, most food establishments don't make it through that. They will you know, close their doors, go out of business. We don't want that to happen. We're um, trying to support not only public health, but our local economy and our local businesses by helping them to be successful. Okay, because I don't know if the one in Holland really recovered fully. Um, Probably not. No. Kyle, I think oh, you had a question. You stated that you, you guys needed eight. How many currently do you have? So if we if we take this part-time position and make it full-time, we have six. Okay. So I'm not asking even that we get all the way up to what I can able to say is like the gold standard. I think we can, we'll be constantly continuing to evaluate this and I, I could be back here again asking for another one, try to get up to seven. I, I like to do things like a period. <laughs> Incrementally. Take small steps and see what impact it has. I don't want to just come in and be like, I need two full time people next month or whatever. When we've got miles. How many restaurants do we have in Ottawa County? Just on top of your head. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and I also want to mention to uh, in 2020, we received an additional. Um, allocation from the state in our, it's called the Essential Local Public Health Services Fund that we get every year for all of our mandated programs and services. And in 2020, that went up almost equal to the amount that we're asking to fund this 0.6 position. So um, I think it was a $10,000 differential, which we also get something called local stabilization funding. And we under budgeted that this year. So we really feel that um, we're not going to be asking for any additional general fund to cover this cost. We've got it covered in some additional state funding, and we believe that that will sustain itself moving forward. Um, and, and it's another okay. thing that, you know, Spencer is uh, saying we're always very, very cautious with the resources that we get. We want to always present a need. We want to look for and evaluate our financial resources um, to make the, the most efficient um, decisions for uh, obviously the the taxpayer dollars. Mandy, is there any option for uh, subcontracting out the inspections or bringing back maybe a retired person on a on a sub subcontract basis within the county to help alleviate some of that? The person that's leaving actually <laughs> is a point for he kind of wanted to retire, and we said, "Oh no, no, no." <laughs> please stay, please stay. And we brought him on as a part-time temporary position. Um, unfortunately, as Spencer mentioned, these positions are really hard to uh, fill because there are requirements in terms of education and training. Um, they have to go through it. Is it six months with a standardized food trainer? Mm -hmm. um, it's quite rigorous. They, they are evaluated by the standardized food trainer. Um, so it's hard unless you can find the perfect person who has the skill set to bring back on. Um, it gets a little tricky. So there, there really is no private industry that would be able to do that like you can get with other. Yeah, the authority is only delegated to local health departments from the state and from the FDA. So it's possible to subcontract like we subcontract with the city of Holland, but he was indirectly a responsibility of ours still. Um, he had to report back to us, even though he was a city of Holland employee for that time period. Mm -hmm. And there's accreditation requirements and all kinds of stuff. And we have, Randy, I mean, it's a great question. And we've looked at that over the years, at least a hundred times. And it, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to take the responsibility of a government regulatory organization and privatize that for a number of reasons. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. I can't say enough how I had on that um, Spencer's department. When I did get sick, um, I couldn't believe how sick somebody can get. Um, and Lisa helped out and uh, the department came up and they found out that there was a problem. So that at least made me feel a little bit better because Good. I was thinking it was something I did. So yeah. anyway. Well, and, and I think again, Al, it's super important to remind people when they do get um, the symptoms that you had, it's always good to report that to the health department. This is how we stop outbreaks from happening um, early on before it spreads to a whole bunch of people. So thank you. Okay. Um, 
Anybody else in your department? Nope, that's it. Okay, thank you. Lynn? Good morning. Uh, I'll be brief today. Um, at CMH, we're pretty busy uh, trying to get our new grant up and running. It's uh, CCBHC for short, stands for Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Uh, that's our grant that's going to bring in about $2 million a year over the next two years with a high likelihood that that will continue on into the future. And just as, as a reminder, um, that grant is going to help us to improve and expand our integrated health efforts, so physical health and mental health. And it's also going to allow us to do a lot more uh, proactive kinds of stuff, preventative work with, around health and wellness. So we're pretty excited about that. It's, it's a big grant. Um, we've already come to the board uh, and asked for positions and we're doing pretty well with filling those positions. There's a couple uh, that we're still uh, trying to find staff for. Uh, we continue to have some difficulty finding staff, particularly uh, master's degree clinicians uh, that's something that is um, a problem across the state of Michigan. Uh, it has a lot to do with the increased demand for mental health services that is, is currently um, prevalent, which is a good thing that people are asking for service. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that we are having a hard time keeping up with that demand because um, of the staffing issues that we're all experiencing. But again, particularly with those master's level positions that can provide therapy and counseling. So we keep um, working about uh, trying to come up with solutions. I know there's some discussion at the county level about some incentives, which I really appreciate. Um, so I've, I've mentioned several times in this meeting that there is um, there are two proposals in the state legislature uh, two, two bills, um, one's Senator Shirky and one is Representative Whiteford's. Um, those continue to be out there. Um, there is currently, if anyone is interested in helping us out, there's um, a petition being circulated through our board association that if anyone is interested in a real quick way to demonstrate that you've got concerns about these proposals, um, this, um, this petition is one way to do that. And if you're interested in, in getting that, I can send you the, the link. I know some people have already um, filled out that petition. It's quite simple, you just put your name and address. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, I don't know if anyone saw yesterday, but the US Surgeon General issued a public health advisory about the mental health challenges um, with young people in this country. I don't think that's necessarily any news to people. Um, we, we all know that the country in general is at a higher level of depression and anxiety because of the things we've all been going through, but in particular, oh, all right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> In particular, uh, young people um, have been identified as, as having um, pretty significant increases of self-reports of depression and anxiety. There, uh, along with this advisory is a 53 page report that if anyone is interested in seeing that, you can Google it easily, but I can also send it to you. So our plan at CMH is to review that report. There are some, um, suggestions and recommendations of things that can be done to help address this situation. And uh, we at CMH, we're planning on reviewing that report very carefully and seeing what we can do to um, continue and, and expand our efforts to help our community uh, deal with some of these issues. So if anyone has questions. Um, Lynn, yeah, um, about that, those bills. Have you heard anything, or John, have you heard anything on the voting of those bills? No. Um, no. The time frame, I should say the time frame. No, there hasn't been a specific time frame um, listed where they're going to vote on either one of those package of bills. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Lynn? 
Thank you. Thank you. Patrick? Yes. Uh, so again, good morning, everyone. And I, so for Community Spoke, uh, we are coming off of 18 months of kind of pandemic response, human, you know, large scale human res service response, uh, support of the health department with some vaccine work. And, and now I think we're, we're starting to get back into some level of normalization, things we used to do before the pandemic. So I just wanted to highlight two examples of some of the um, kind of smaller ways that Spoke has been able to, to make a difference in the human services space. So one is with um, Ottawa County Sheriff's Department and one of the new teams that they launched actually in partnership with uh, Lynn and CMH, and that's their CIT team, which is Crisis Intervention Team. Yep. Crisis intervention team. So I don't know if you, you all have been updated on that before, if Lynn's talked about that, but just such a uh, such an amazing model of bringing mental health services alongside, uh, you know, police officers that are going out on crisis calls and a couple months in um, and already just, I mean, I've just heard some updates from Val the other day and just some of the examples of what used to be you know, we get 10 calls to this household because of crisis issues. And now we go out and actually provide some mental health services, get them connected in the community. And those calls stop. Those people are actually getting helped. Um, and so big kudos to CMH and the Sheriff's Department for, for working collaboratively on this. What we've been able to do, though, is as this new program is rolling out, the police officers are saying, hey, there's actually more than just mental health services that are needed at these calls. Sometimes they're in the middle of the night. There's need for emergency shelter. Sometimes there's there's legitimate reasons why they can't go to the Holland Rescue Mission or there's clothing issues, food insecurity issues, things that the, the police officers need to address in the moment in, in a time of crisis. Um, and so we've been able to come alongside the Sheriff's Department, Lynn's team and say, OK, how can we help plug some of those basic basic needs, um, bringing some of our nonprofit providers to the table. Um, so working on ideas where uh, police officers actually will have, for example, this is one of the ideas, you know, keys to, to lockers at, at local food pantries, where in the middle of the night, um, no one's working, but they could go and stop by in, in different quadrants of the county, they could, they could stop by a nonprofit partner, pick up a bag of food, pick up a coat, whatever might be needed. Um, so trying to help problem solve in ways like that to meet some of these needs when people um, are really at their most vulnerable um, uh, you know, uh, place. So just a small example. The other one is we have, uh, have been providing uh, connection support with some of the refugee resettlement that's been taking place in our community and in West Michigan um, as well. And so Bethany Christian Services, obviously taking the, the big lead. They're the, the organization that, that um, is the lead in that space. Um, but as we're you know, starting to see folks that are trickling in, need for housing, need for employment, need for, you know, food, you know, food needs, other basic needs. Um, and once again, kind of our model of being able to help uh, put some of the nonprofit providers, some of the government providers and help come around those families um, as they're, as they're entering our community. So just uh, two kind of smaller examples. A lot of what I've been updating on is, is kind of big scale pandemic response, but just some of the things that um, I think in normal times we're able to play um, a little bit of that connecting role. So that's it for my update today. Any questions, for Patrick? Yes, Patrick, if a if a business wants to, um, uh, with the refugees coming in, if a business wants to, you know, offer employment, how how would they go about, or what's a way that they can offer that? I'd rec I'd recommend connecting directly with Bethany um, Christian Services. Yeah, they they have a, a full time staff person that's helping with the resettlement efforts and and really connecting all of those dots. I can say I know or. Uh, I shouldn't say it with, with certainty. I believe that the refugees are coming in and uh, immediately getting that uh, whatever, I don't know if it's a visa or a certificate, something that allows them to, to work right away. I know that was one of the questions early on, um, but as we all know with the labor shortage, uh, that we would all welcome uh, additional workers if we could. So I, I know they're certified to be able to jump in, but Bethany would be the point of contact. Um, our community health workers have also linked people to employment. And so um, I don't know if it would help for us to know. I don't know. Anyway, good. Bethany's probably the best bet. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Yep. Anything else for Patrick? Okay. Um, first one on Zoom, uh, Kendra. 
Good morning. Um, I'm hoping to be in person next time. That's my, my goal. Um, but just a few updates. Um, first, we did receive our staffing allocation finally for this fiscal year. And as we anticipated, um, we did receive some um, in the draft um, additional workers for our assistance payment side due to the caseloads continuing to remain high. Um, staff are hovering around 900 cases apiece. Um, mind you, pre-COVID levels were about 600. So you're talking about a very significant number of individuals still on assistance cases. Um, we continue to provide the supplement of um, maximum benefit for food assistance that was actually just approved for December. And individuals continue to maintain on Medicaid unless they're contacting us to close their case. So there is no reviews still for those that may have been placed on Medicaid during the initial pandemic. So um, that continues to be the case. So we're grateful, obviously, if we're going to be able to um, finalize those allocations to maintain staff and, and increase our staffing levels. Um, we also received an additional foster home licensing worker, continuing those initiatives, continuing to try and find homes in our community. It was nice to see that we do have the, the highest number of foster homes in our region within our county. Um, so that was nice to see that we are getting credit again for the excellent work that's happening with our, in our community. And then just a couple of things I wanted to highlight very quickly. First, actually during this meeting, um, we are having a virtual baby fair, which is the first that has occurred. And for us, it's for individuals that are either in foster care or left foster care recently that are pregnant moms. And we were able to partner with the health department and many other agencies to bring those agencies to the moms at our office to hook up those services right away. So a very nice handoff. Um, which is fantastic because many times those young ladies may not know where to go or do not have the additional supports that they may have had um, if they weren't in foster care. So this is the first time we've done that and very excited to see that I've already gotten some pictures and such. So um, definitely some success there. Um, we're going to be doing something similar. Um, it looks like through our, our pre prevention program, hopefully at the beginning of the year, doing something similar for those of adopted families. So um, excited about that as well. And then lastly, um, we have um, a couple of donated fund positions that are partnerships between agencies and us. Um, we have one with the ISD that was approved this fiscal year. And so that was one of the reasons for our increase. And then we also have one with CMH that we've had for a long time. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to Lynn and her team, because it looks like we may be having um, our staff from there going to Refresh, which is um, one of the locations where homeless individuals can go to get their mail, to take a shower, to get a meal, wash their clothes, et cetera. So we may be having the staff partner with um, the CMH staff to go there and make sure that we are assisting the homeless population um, a little bit more readily face-to-face -face, as unfortunately a lot of our services are still online. And I really wanna make sure that we're bridging that gap locally to ensure that we are also getting out into the community. So I think those are my updates. Thank you. Kendra, Kendra uh, yeah. okay, maybe I'm out of touch, okay? What is Refresh? So Refresh is actually located at a church um, and they offer services for the homeless population, I believe. don't. I think it's three days a week, like Tuesday, Thursday, Friday is my understanding. Um, we've got homeless outreach services that go out to assist individuals that might be there. Like I mentioned, they offer food, they offer an opportunity for them to take a shower, wash their clothes. Um, many of them, they get their mail there as well. Um, so like even if they're getting items from our department, the mailing address a lot of times is refresh. So it's a great, great location and um, they have quite a few individuals that access that service. Is this strictly a local startup type thing help or is this statewide, nationwide? Nope. Um, um, there are, I mean, there's different communities that have a similar model or um, agencies, but this is truly a local, um, there's not like refresh in different communities. Okay. okay. And the church supports it. They're the ones that are funding it. That's opinion. my understanding, but don't quote me. No, okay. okay. Community Action House. Yeah. Community Action House is the nonprofit that's behind it, but they work in partnership with the church. Okay. Thank you. I do have one question. Yeah. What's, what are you seeing the biggest um, thing that's uh, causing people to stay on the unemployment and not go seeking work? You're saying, because you said that there's more now than there was before COVID? 
Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say necessarily our cash assistance program. Um, for food assistance and Medicaid, yes. Um, so there isn't any changes with the employment piece for that. Tech, or, so let me just, so for Medicaid, for example, if people got, went on Medicaid starting April, 2020, when COVID first started, um, many people were not employed and or were laid off, right? For that, when the closure was happening. So people came in and applied for Medicaid in order to ensure that they had insurance. Um, the feds and Michigan did an extension so that individuals that got Medicaid at that point cannot be shut off unless they come back to us and say, I want my Medicaid off and provide us something to state that they basically have something else. So many people have not done that. They're just staying on the Medicaid because they can. Whereas otherwise, pre-COVID, we used to have to do reviews. And so we would review at least annually to make sure they're still eligible. So there's many people that probably aren't eligible. Maybe they've gone back to work or they've gotten different employment, but we can't reach out to them and ask for that information. So we even are getting wage matches, which is when someone does get a job and their social security matches our system, we will get notified, but we can't even do anything with those wage matches at this point. Same with the um, with food assistance. Um, we can shut off people's food assistance. However, if they are eligible, they get to receive the max benefit. So let's say for um, a family of one, so like a single adult, um, in the past, they would have received $16 a month for food assistance. Now they're able to receive the maximum amount, which I believe is 85 at this point. Huh. But yeah, cash assistance, cash assistance maintains. So if someone applies for cash assistance um, or our BIP, it's called, um, they're still required to go to PATH um, through Michigan Works. So that process continues to be the same. Now, have we seen a slight increase from pre-COVID numbers? Yes, um, but we have a number of people asking for deferrals. May that be that now they're wanting to watch their child at home and do homeschooling instead of going back to work. Um, that sometimes is some of the deferral requests. Um, but not a huge uptick of people continuing on cash assistance. It would be our other programs. And you said that's a Fed and state thing? Yes, yep. And how many people are we talking about? Do you know? That is a great question. Um, well, I mean, if we look at our average numbers, that's an additional 300 per staff. And so that I would, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty hefty number. We're anticipating a lot of work um, when these extensions go away. So we're really hopeful that the department's gonna do a really good job <laughs> of communicating out to the clients, especially when it comes to Medicaid. Um, when we had our cat or our um, food assistance closures in the past, usually they would send out a letter. They would say, please make sure that you've got information to provide to your worker to say that you believe you're still eligible. Um, that process did work very well and we were able to close cases um, pretty swiftly. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen this time. I think a, a lot of people are gonna then go to their pharmacy or they're gonna go to the ER and they're gonna say, sorry, your Medicaid is closed. Um, and I think we're gonna receive a lot of um, concerns and complaints by individuals if they were just assuming they were gonna be able to stay on Medicaid and maybe not get insurance through their current employer which I believe may be happening. I don't know if people are like saying, no, I don't want my insurance. I'll just take the, the cash lump sum or, you know, I'm already getting insurance through Medicaid. So those are some of the things I think as a communication to the community, once we find out that that is going to start happening is going to be very, very important. Okay. Thank you, Kendra. You're welcome. Um, any questions for Kendra? Okay. Uh, Jennifer, Community Action House, you're up. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jen from Community Action Agency, and we are um, we're currently getting ready for our senior food distribution, which happens every other month. Um, the change this month, or in January rather, is that we will be partnering with Feeding America to do our food distribution. Um, so they will be doing um, the, the driving of the truck and getting those um, food items delivered to the site. So that'll be a huge help for us, which is very exciting to have that partnership with them um, because we are still looking to fill um, an assessment and eligibility specialist role, a part-time role. 
um, that was formerly held by Catherine Van Sweden. Um, so she ran our food program. So we still have that gap there um, that we're trying to fill. Um, so it's been a little labor intensive on our team right now. So Feeding America will be a really great addition um, to that program. Uh, we are also working on planning our Walk for Warmth um, annual fundraiser. Um, that's going to happen in person this year. Uh, we learned that virtual was not super successful um, last year, but um, it'll be held on February 5th at 8.30 in the morning. That's a Saturday morning, and we're going to hold it at City on a Hill in Zealand. So we're excited about um, ho hosting that again in person. Um, and then lastly, um, we have a water assistance program starting. I believe I mentioned it at another meeting, but that's much closer to starting within the next couple of weeks. We've been working hard on getting um, MOUs out to different water providers. Um, so we're excited to be able to provide water assistance for those that have a past due water bill of up to $650. Um, so it's nice to have um, some additional funding out there to, to help with water, um, especially for homeowners, because a lot of the, um, the funding that we have right now through um, the SARA funds is to help renters. So this pot of money will be able to assist renters, but also homeowners that have past due water bills. And that is pretty much us, it for us. Um, Jennifer, one question, what yeah. warmth? When is the date on that? Yes, it's Saturday, February 5th Okay. at 8.30. And is there going to be an online um, place where you can contribute money for that? Yes. yes. So if you go to our um, page, um, actually, if you, I'm um, trying to find a better way for you to get there. Um, if you go to miottawa.org and then forward slash, it's W4W. And that'll get you straight there. And okay. you can donate online and register online as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Jennifer? Okay. Well, the next one is our last public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak? Go for it. Thank you. My name is Sylvia Rodia and I live in Allendale. And I just wanna to bring to your attention a couple of uh, issues that I'm hearing from the community. The Department of Public Health is now utilizing harsher quarantine guidelines for unvaccinated students, despite vaccinated individuals also contracting and spreading COVID. As we know well, quarantines yield significant loss of social, emotional and academic learning as well as loss of athletics, extracurricular activities, and in-person contact with friends, and in turn, mental health decline. When children need help with mental health issues, in some cases now, healthy unvaccinated children are not being seen in person, with only Zoom available due to their vaccination status. This dual treatment of children is discriminatory and harmful. We ask you to ensure any community mental health funded providers are not participating in this practice and encourage community providers to provide in-person support to all children. And then lastly, um, I, I would just ask the health department to, to focus on making sure that we have early treatment options available to all of our community men members. That's a real gap in services right now. We have a significant portion of our population who simply is not going to choose to be vaccinated. And um, there need to be some measures put in place to ensure that people can get the treatment that they need so that our hospitals aren't overwhelmed. Thanks. Thank you, Sylvia. Anybody else out there? Please state your name and where you're from, um, and you got three minutes. My name is David Barnoski. I vote in Port Sheldon Township, and I live in West Olive. I continue to support the health department. But other than that, I, have a, I wouldn't have got up just to say that. Um, just seeing me, you probably know that. Um, I have a petty little process comment, and then I'll sit down. Um, but because your broadcasting of these meetings, these subcommittee meetings is new, 
I imagined if I was home, I might have preferred Mr. Rohde sat, uh, spoke closer to a microphone. It was right here. <laughs> That's it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>